Father, as we look into your word, I pray that you will speak to our hearts about how we deal with burdens of life, whether we pass the test or whether we don't. I pray that you'll use your word to challenge us, to remind us, to convict us. Bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 39. Psalm 39. I'd like to speak to you from that passage. And just briefly a little bit from Psalm 38. But first of all, Psalm 39. um, I've I've entitled this message, uh, Coping with the Burdens of Life. Now, when I say burdens, I could be meaning, um, you know, illness. Uh, I could be meaning, you know, uh, family difficulties, uh, loss of job, um, whether it's cancer, whether it's uh, persecution, um, whatever you want to put in that. And so life is full of burdens. We can't get away from that. We do know that there are certain groups of religious churches that teach, for example, that once you come to Christ, that you won't be in a wheelchair, you won't owe any money, everything will just be great. But we all here know that that simply is not true and is in fact not taught in the Word of God. The truth is, when we become a believer, we are plagued often with burdens and trials. And I think as Paul and Timothy really did prophesy, now whether we're exactly in those days or not, we will be living in times of stress. I think we are living in times of stress, whether it's the same as what Timothy was talking about or not. And all we have to do is look around us. If you don't have anything to worry about, let me give you something to worry about. Maybe you'd like something to worry about. If you don't have anything, let me give you a few. Uh, the fiscal cliff. Okay? Your taxes are going to go up. We're all going to drop off the cliff. Um, another is, and this is probably worse yet, you know, uh, this administration has been printing money like a drunken sailor. We have printed more money than any time in our history. And this simply means that uh, runaway inflation is always going to come. It's just a matter of time. Or how about war in the Middle East? Uh, That could expand. Uh, Do you have enough money for retirement? Oh, dear. Okay. Uh, How about health? Or how about health care? Let's see. Terrorism. Drought. You know, we've got less rain. You know, they're saying, and if you go west of us, there's even less rain than what we've had. In some cases, half of what we've had. And they're worried about the crops. Famine. We can always find something to worry about, can't we? That we really can. So, That's just part of life. And we as believers, however, need to learn how to deal with burdens in a different way than an unbeliever would deal with them. You know, David says, I think, ultimately what he's going to uh, infer to us tonight is that the best we can do is to change what we need to do is change our mindset. And we need to look at, at life with Christ vertically. We should not look horizontally at our problems first. Like what Paul said in Colossians 3.1. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So that is a good introduction to how we should live our life, I believe, when we suffer from difficulties, and we will. Now, before I get to Psalm 39, I want to say this. Usually it's impossible to say, why does one psalm follow another? You know, it's very rare because it's not chronological, you can't say this was written and so it leads to the next one. That's not usually the way it is. With the exception, you remember about a year ago we were doing our study on Wednesday nights with the Song of Ascents, uh, the Psalm of Ascents, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. That you could do because it was, it was kind of like it was building up. It kept building up to Psalm 34, you might say the crescendo, when they returned there back before the temple. But I kind of think Psalm 37, 38, and 39, I think they fit together. Psalm 37, I wish we could go there, beautiful psalm, dealing with trusting God. How important it is not to fret, but to trust God and wait for deliverance. And the waiting, of course, is the hard part. When you come to Psalm 38, you find that this waiting is now put into practice. David is struggling exceedingly, as you're going to see here in a minute. He is struggling with as severe things as any any person can struggle with. And so he is being tested. He's being tested with the problem of his own sin, which he admits he's being chastened by God for, along with his enemies. And the world is just run amok around him. And he is in a, in a desperate situation. So there's the great test. So this leads us then to Psalm 39, I believe, 
uh, because David is, is contemplating life's brevity. He begins to come before God. He talks about the brevity of life and how he is going to cope with it and how he needs God to help him. So it kind of puts life into perspective, I believe. All right, let's look briefly at Psalm 38 before we get to Psalm 39. So if you'd like to look to Psalm 38, let me read uh, briefly. I want to go through this fairly quickly. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, verse 1, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me as your hand has come down on me. Now, the imagery of that is really traumatic. I mean, we understand that. I mean, this is very serious. And he talks about death later, the potential of death for him. He's in a serious situation. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. Now, without a doubt, one, one thing we have to conclude here, and, and you even see it through the next, this rest of this chapter and the next. Without a doubt, David sees his illness or his burdens here, if we want to say it that way, as a punishment from God for his sin. There is no doubt because David is giving that testimony. That is his testimony. It's not what I'm saying. Now, we understand that not all sickness is chastening from God. In fact, probably most of it is not. Is not. We even remember Job. You remember Job and his suffering. Um, he was a righteous man, but yet he suffered, didn't he? He suffered greatly. In fact, the Bible says he was a blameless and upright man, a man who fears God and shuns evil, yet he suffered from God. Well, his suffering was a demonstration before Satan, wasn't it? That as much as he tried, it is possible for a believer to love God for who he is and not what he gives us. And Satan was defeated in that, was he not? In fact, that was proven when he said this. You remember this famous text? It's in chapter 1. Naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, when you get somebody like that that's suffering burdens and trials, if they can honestly say it and mean it, you can't defeat that man. You can't defeat him because he's won. There is nothing you can do to him. You can ultimately kill him and it won't matter. Because you cannot defeat a man who can say that and mean it. And so we praise the Lord for that example. You remember the man born blind. I don't know how many of you were in Sunday school last Sunday. We're showing the, the Gospel of John and we went over John chapter 9. There was a man born blind... Uh, from, from uh, birth, and the disciples, remember, they took, they took the opportunity and they, they uh, asked Jesus, they said, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Because they assumed, well, anytime you have trials, troubles, you're blind, you're sick or whatever, it has to be a punishment from God. And you remember Jesus' answer? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. In other words, it's obvious here that God had chosen this situation to bring glory to himself from this man's suffering, which he had nothing to do. He was obviously born, but it gave Jesus Christ the opportunity to put spittle on, remember, and put it on his eyes if you saw that. And God got the glory. God was glorified through it. Now, David is suffering for sin. We, we know that. We, we can see that David is also suffering for sin. He, ad, he admits that here. Now, as long as we are sinners, and though hopefully all of us here are children of God, yet we know that we're still all sinners. So it's probably appropriate to think about that, however. To think about what David said. Am I being chastened by God? Because of some sin in my life. And I like what James Montgomery Boyce said. He's got uh, uh, three books on the Psalms. Very good. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, a wonderful preacher from East, the uh, 10th Presbyterian Church, wasn't it, Tim? Yeah. Great man of God, a great writer. He was just a superman. And uh, he's with the Lord now. But, I mean, he was, you know, God the man. This is what he said. He said, uh, you know, uh, he suggests that we ask three questions when we're... Uh, confronted with sickness or calamity. Number one, have I sinned or gotten off track? 
And is this setback God's way of getting me back on track and into fellowship with Him? That's a good question. And it, we ought to ask that question. I think it's a good one. Now, he, he explains though. He said he's not talking about this, uh, you know, being, being abnormally introspective. You know, going back to, oh, you know, 50 years ago I did this to my teacher. Oh my goodness. Or whatever it is. Maybe you had a, a traumatic life before you were saved. You say, if God is judging me. And no, no. You don't go back and dig up some kind of sin and try to figure out, you know, God must be punishing me for something. I can't figure out what it is. I just haven't gone back far enough. No, no, he's, he's not suggesting that at all. You don't become morbid about trying to dig up your sin. That's not the point. But God is using sickness. If he is to stop us short, then it is appropriate that we would ask this question. But it's a futile exercise to go back and, and, and go, you know, try to bring something up. Because his point that he makes is this. This is what he said. If God is doing this with you, that is, if it's sin, I mean, you've done something that's sin. If God is doing this with you, you will know it just as David knew it. That's good. Okay? David knew it. David knew it. And David knew not every every trial he had was necessarily judging him for sin. But God, I believe, will show us that, if that's the case. Here's the second question he brought up. Is God using this to trim off some rough edges of my personality? And to develop me more like Jesus Christ in character? That's a good question because that could be. You know, uh, none of us like hard times, but the truth is hard times build character. We don't want hard times, but that is a truth. It is something we absolutely know. And God, God may be also, through that, developing us into a sensitivity for someone. Okay, let's say you go through a particular trial. Cancer, loss of a spouse, I don't know what it might be. God has made you sensitive when it happens to another brother. And God may have just brought you through that so that you can encourage others. So see, I like that question. That's a good one. Here's his third question. Is God using my suffering as a stage upon which he may be glorified? Very possible. And obviously there have been biblical examples of that and we just gave you a few. Now although David confesses his sin... And he recognizes, as we'll see here in a little bit, yet he does recognize that he is being judged for his sin. And God has made that clear to him. So I think that's very important in this distinction. But what is important now for David is, okay, even though he may be judging us, even though God may be chastening us for sin is, what is important that we glorify God in the way which we deal with it? How do we deal with it? Do we deal it with bitterness? With anger? Anger at God? Or whatever it might be? Or we deal with it the way God wants us to deal with it. Okay, so there is clearly a difference. And, and I think that's the challenge that actually is before, before David. Uh, let me go on reading here. Uh, verse 6. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. Without a doubt, I believe what we are seeing here, it's, it's, you, could, you could see it as a picture of a believer in a state of being out of fellowship with God because of sin in his life. And this is by David's own testimony. Keep in mind, these are his words. And, and he recognizes this and that... that his suffering uh, is because of his sin. And I think that's what you're seeing. Now, we are not told what this sin is, by the way. Okay, David is talking both in this chapter and the next. But we're not told. I don't think it's Bathsheba. And that, I, I, but, but we don't know. We're not told. God has chosen not to tell us what sin it is. Uh, look at verse 11. We find another thing that's perplexing. My friends and my companions stand aloof from my plague. And my nearest kin stand far off. I don't know if you've ever been there. Have you ever been estranged from your family? This really is making David speechless. On a number of cases, in these two chapters, 38 and 39, he's become speechless. And I think this is so overwhelming for him. My friends, my, my loved ones, how could they turn their back on me? David is clearly dealing with a sense of isolationism. He is right now very much alone. And you know, the truth is that loneliness 
is one of the most devastating precursors to depression, to discouragement. And maybe some of you have suffered by your family who they turned on you. They won't talk. Maybe it's because of your faith in Christ. Maybe it's because of something else. You understand the depth of how that hurts because it does. Whether you admit it or not, it does sink deeply like that arrow David talked about going inside. We may not verbalize it. We may not tell anybody. But it hurts to be estranged by your own family, whether they're believers or not. All right. Now, let's look at verse 12. And indeed, I'll tell you, if there's ever a time, and that happens to your friends, if there's ever a time, uh, that's when you need to be intimate with God. Confess your sins and be right with Him. All right, let me just quickly, I want to finish the chapter reading verse 12. Those who seek my life. There's somebody seeking my life, okay? They lay their snares or their traps. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man I do not hear. Like a, like a mute man, a mute man who, who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord my God, who will answer. For I said, only let them not rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. If you come to the realization of what David did, that God is dealing in your life with you because of sin in your life, that's number one. That's the first thing you do. And after you say you're sorry for your sin, you forsake that sin. Let me go on reading. But my foes, my enemies are uh, vigorous. They are mighty. And many of those who hate me wrongfully, those who render me evil for good, accuse me because I follow after good, because I'm doing good to them. I'm accused. This is hard. It's probably happened to you. It's happened to me. You do something that you know was good and you're criticized for it. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Okay, folks, folks this, the reason I read this is because here is a man that is desperate and hurting. He is desperate and he is hurting. So this brings us into Psalm 39. I'm using two different swords, by the way. One's an ESV and the other's a New American Standard. I figure if one sword is good, two is better. So, all right. I just like doing that sometimes. So I am now in Psalm 39 reading from the New American Standard. Psalm 39, David said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. I was dumb or mute and silent. I refrained even from good and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Now here we have, how are we going to take that first verse? He says, I don't want to sin with my tongue. In fact, he says, I'm going to not say anything when I'm in the presence of the wicked. All right, number one, let's take it at face value. He seems to be talking about his testimony to the unsaved. You might have unsaved in your family. You may work with unsaved people. And he seems to be talking about that. He said, I don't want to do something that's going to take away from the glory of God or that will make people think bad about God. All right, let's think about this in the the first format that I think he's talking about. You work around unbelievers or maybe you you have some activity you do, a service for your community or something, but either way, you're around unbelievers. They know you're a Christian. They know you, you say that, you're, you're, you're a born again Christian. You're going to go to heaven and you just, you know, you, you know, you trust the Lord. He's my savior. He provides for me. And then one day you walk into the office and you begin crying and you begin murmuring and you begin fretting and you begin worrying. Oh, I'm not going to have enough money for my aunt. Oh, my, 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 whatever the, oh, and it just all of a sudden. And so the unbeliever begins looking at you and he says, then why would I want your God? If he doesn't help you, why would he help me? You see? 
So we, need, we as Christians need to be very careful when we speak around unbelievers. Are we bringing glory to God or are we going to, in a fretting state, maybe say something we'll be very sorry we did and detract from the possible gospel to this person that we're talking about? And I do think that's what David has in mind, but I do think it goes even deeper than that. I think as we keep in mind what I read in Psalm 38, this man has sin. What sin? We don't know. He's got people trying to kill him. His family has ostracized him. His friends have ostracized him. The world is going from bad to worse. The truth does not seem to be winning out because he's doing good and he still gets persecuted. Life is hard. Things are tough. And you know, frankly, why he may be keeping quiet is because what he really wants to do is punch him out. I don't know. I mean, look at what he said. Look in verse 3. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Listen, he says, I'm pondering and it's building up into anger. He's seething. He is ready to explode. And he looks at not only, yes, the bad things he does, but he looks at the injustices in earth, in the world around him. And it's probably making him angry. And so I think it goes even deeper, as I said, than just the testimony. I think it's he is really frustrated with what's going on around him. Now, let me say a word before I go into verse 4. You know, Psalm 39, as you're going to see here in this next verse, asks us to think about the brevity of life. How short it is. Now, the world doesn't want you to think about how short life is. The world doesn't want you to think about, you know, uh, uh, death and eternity and all that. No, the world, does, that spoils your fun. Don't think about those things. Oh, don't get so serious about that. Look, the devil hates us to think about the meaning of life. He doesn't want us to think about heaven or hell. He doesn't want us to think about these things. Not at all. James said, therefore, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they all conspire against you. They want to keep you amused and entertained. They don't want you to think about the brevity of life, which is the very thing God's Word tells us to think about. But they don't want to. The world doesn't want to. The devil doesn't want to. Here's kind of a sidelight, which is interesting, I think. We have an English word, amusement. Interesting enough, right in the middle, muse, is the word that we have here. Uh, in verse 3 that David uses, I was musing, the fire burned. While I was musing, the fire burned. So you have that word muse in it, which basically means to ponder. Uh, it means to meditate. It means to think. Now, here's the interesting thing is. Amusement has a negative preset, pre, uh, prefix, the A. So, in fact, what you have here is a muse meant, which means don't think. It means don't meditate. Empty your mind. What is it? The yoga? Isn't that the yoga thing where you just empty everything and just look at your navel? Now, if you've ever been able to empty your mind, who do you think is going to fill it? Yeah, right. That's why the devil loves to have you have an empty mind. In other words, we go out and we have a ball. I don't want to think about work. I don't want to think about church. I don't want to think about God. I just want to go out and have fun. And I'll tell you, that's the way the world is around us. We all know it. We see it every day. It's sad that most people just drift through life with that kind of a concept and with that kind of an idea. We don't want to think about eternity. But Psalm 39 is a rebuke to people who who, who go through that kind of folly or sinfulness. And, you know, Psalm 139, God wants us to think about the brevity of life and how to apply it to our hearts to gain wisdom. And to know how to live. Look at verse 4 now. See, he was keeping quiet. He wouldn't say a word. But now at the end of verse 3, he said, Then I spoke with my tongue. Now, I want you to specifically notice. He didn't speak to his relatives. He didn't speak to the men and the women that are trying to kill him. He didn't speak to... he, He didn't talk... What He talked to God. This is very important. He talked to God. All right. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord. Make me to know my end. And what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am or how frail I am. Really interesting verse, isn't it, when you think about that? Lord, make me know how uh, to know my end and what is the extent of my days that I may know how frail I am. Lord, help me to know that life will end. 
Help me to know that. It puts death in perspective. It puts eternity in perspective, doesn't it? And it makes us think about the very thing the devil doesn't want us to think about. But this is what he says. Now, here in verse 4, he doesn't mean, I'm weary of suffering. God, tell me when I'm going to die because I've got to put this to an end. I want this to be over with. I can't stand the pain of life and I just want to die. Tell me how long I have to live. No, that is not what he's saying. He is in fact saying, God, make me rightly to know and estimate the shortness of my life and the uncertainty of human life. I want to know about that uncertainty, okay? So that instead of suffering anger or bitterness at God or somebody or something, I will cast myself upon you entirely and I will serve you with joy the remainder of my life. You remember Moses wrote one psalm, and that was Psalm 90. And you've heard the verse probably at funerals. It's sometimes read at funerals. probably should be every time. But Moses said this in Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You see, we gain a heart of wisdom by thinking about death. Now, that doesn't seem right, but it's true. It's true about the brevity of life. Because that will help us to live life and to live the time that God has put us on this earth properly. And it also prepares us for heaven. Now, does David learn by turning to God? Yes, emphatically, he does. And the first things he, learn, he learns is that as puzzling as the brevity of life may be, it is nevertheless something that God has willed. He has willed it. Period. Okay? He has given us a fixed span of life. Every one of us have a fixed span of life. And you know what? That brevity of life, whatever it is, whether you think it's 180, 60, 40, 20, 10, what, that brevity of life has meaning. Okay? It's a fixed span because God, look at verse 5. Let me read verse 5. Behold, he goes on to say, Thou hast made my days as hand breaths or span, and my lifetime as nothing in thy sight. Surely every man is at his best a mere breath of vapor. That's how quick life is. Joyce and I were just talking about that driving to church. It seems like we should be 20 years old. What happened? We just all of a sudden look at each other. What happened? Where'd it go? And I know you younger people think that'll never happen. Trust me, when you get as old as me, you'll feel that way. And some of you aren't as old as me and you're feeling that way. Right? I mean, that's kind of the way it is sometimes. But the truth is, that is a fact. We have been given a, a, a portion of life, but it is it has brevity. And that's no accident because that's planned by God. That means it must be good because God is good and God has planned it. So brevity of life is good. It's designed by God. Now, I think he also learns here that since life is short, the only real meaning of a man and woman's existence must be in his relationship to God. Because God is eternal. It's the only one. It's the only relationship that we should have in that regard. God is eternal. And so David turns to God. And you know, we should bring our troubles to God as well. We should follow David's example. When in a situation like very much like Philippians. Remember Philippians... 4, 6, and 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Did you notice this part? With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Present your request to your banker. Present your request to your credit card. Present your request to your church. Present your request to... Now, that doesn't mean God uses... God may use your banker to provide for you. God may use the church to provide for you. But keep in mind, the church or the banker or your credit card are not God. 
Go to God and let Him provide for you. You do not need these things unless God seeks to work through them. One of the mistakes I see many dear brethren do. Instead, they go to every, they tell everybody they know about their problem. They tell everybody they know about, I got whatever it is that I need. And they forget about God. Well, if you forget about God and you don't present your request to Him, notice then you're not going to have the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Because you know what? You're going to give credit for whatever you got from John Doe or Mary Smith or whoever. Or however you got it, right? But when you give it to God, and God in some mysterious way gives it to you, who gets the glory? God. Now that's what God always wants. One of the fatal, not fatal, one of the, one of the great mistakes though that many believers make is they ask other people instead of God. And that's a mistake. And I think that's clear from Scripture. Now although David, uh, he is brought to this, let's call it a boiling point, okay? Uh, he refuses to express himself in the presence of unbelievers. So I think that's always something to remember. Always bring it before God first. Now, uh, I believe what Moses said is important. We need to number our days. Um, we need to gain a heart of wisdom. Uh, we need to spend our remaining days, whether they're few or many, with joy, with an inner peace, and serve God with our whole heart. Something happened to my wife and I uh, Monday night, actually it was Monday afternoon, where God really spoke to me, woke me up. We were, I'd come back from the grocery stores around 2 o'clock and I started having a pain in my left arm. And uh, it was pretty bad. It started up here and it just wouldn't go away. It was on a couple hours and sat down with Joyce. We talked about it. I said, well, I better check my blood pressure. It was high. So I said, well, we better <clears throat> kind of monitor this. And so <clears throat> we, uh, I checked, waited a little while and I checked it again. It was higher yet. And I said, well, if this keeps doing that, I, you know, we're probably going to have to do something. We, you know, we know what the symptoms are of a heart attack. And so we um, decided that well, I said, well, let's wait another 10 minutes and then I'm going to check it again. I checked it again and it was a higher yet. You know, it was like, I don't know, close to 200 over 100. And I said, we got to go. So I took four aspirin and, and four baby aspirin. And uh, we, we went to the uh, emergency room at, at Liberty Hospital. And boy, that was, that was an experience. My goodness. They didn't have any beds. They had all 40 emergency beds filled. This place was a mess. There were police there. I couldn't believe it. I thought, what am I doing here? And she said, no, you did the right thing. And then we had to sit down with her. They were in such a mess. It took them 45 minutes to get me to a bed. I mean, I'm glad I didn't die before that because I could have because it took me 45 minutes to get to a bed. But I finally got to the bed and they went through the, you know, if you've ever had that done, it's quite an experience. I, I got to say, I mean, so, so here I am, you know, we're basically three and a half hours on a bed um, with hoses all around me. I got here, I got uh, here, I got here, I got here, 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 and then what? Oh, here, and I'm going, my goodness. So I'm forced to lay on this bed for about three and a half hours. Now, it was kind of interesting, though. I mean, we're waiting on the outcome. And, and I will say the outcome was good. We're thankful. The enzymes, they check, and they, they do all that to tell whether you've had a heart attack or whether you could be. Everything was great. All blood tests, everything was good. He said, great, you get to go home. So that, that was exciting. I mean, just end it that way and let you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm laying there, and Joyce is not far from me, and we talked a little bit, and neither one of us have been through anything like that. But I will say that Moses' words began to echo in my mind. And I thought, uh, how do you do this? I said, how many days do I have? So I started thinking about when my father died and how old he was. I started thinking about my mother and how old she was when she died. And a few other people that I could think of. And I, I began to look at my age, and I began to say, you know, of course, we don't know for sure. But I can tell you this, that if for no other reason God used that for me to stop and think and make me count my days. You see, I'm like you. I mean, I, I know I'm, I, I'm older. I'm 67. And, you know, but even at that, our life, I'm not retired. So our life is like yours. And we go, we're so busy. You know, we're just so busy. We don't have time for things like this. Do you, we're so busy. We don't have time to contemplate eternity. We don't have time to talk about the brevity of life, but God put me on my back and I got to talk to God about the brevity of life. And it was very profitable for me and I, I thank the Lord for that. You know, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, turn with me there 
uh, just quickly. We, we, I think we have time. I, w- I want to quickly go through Ecclesiastes and then we'll, we'll finish this out. But, but it's interesting because Ecclesiastes, uh, uh, Solomon talks about this in chapter 12. Really, everything we're, I've said so far tonight. It's, it's very similar to what David is teaching us. Um, actually, what I want to do, Ecclesiastes, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I know it's one of those a little hard to find, but Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Okay, let me back up to verse 7 of chapter 11. Let me go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 7. I want to read that as an introduction to chapter 12. The light is pleasant, and it is good for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all, and let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. My son Mike, when he was even pretty young, started getting into, you know, He's young, but he's getting into the world and the pressures of having to have a job and all this. And he started saying pretty young, life is hard and then you die. Mm. You know, sometimes it's that simple. Life is hard and then you die. It just seems like it's about that quick. Let me go on reading verse 9. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. And follow the impulses of your heart. And the desires of your eyes, but yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So remove vexation from your heart and put away evil from your body. Because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. They're fleeting. You know what Solomon's saying is here? The glory of youth ends. I want you to understand that. The glory of youth ends ends for everybody. Now, we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 12. Remember also the Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, when you will say, I have no delight in them, because, you know, you've gotten older. Young people remember your Creator. Old people remember your Creator. All right, look at verse 2. Before the sun, the light, the moon, and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. I think he's basically describing the dawn of life. We're young and we're a child and then youth and then middle age and then old age. And I think it's just kind of describing that. And then in verse 3, in the day that the watchmen of the house shake. In other words, probably the, the, uh, the husband of the home, the leader of the home, the, whether it's the grandfather in a, in a clan type or in your home. I think that is the idea. But even the man who used to be the head of your home, strong, you know, and tough, and, and he provided for the family, he shakes, the come, times come he shakes. And mighty men stoop. The grinding ones stand idle because they are few. It's your teeth. Okay? And those who look through windows grow dim. Now your eyes go. Cataracts. Those things. And the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. Now wait a minute. Usually the grinding mill is loud, but it's low, so there go the ears. But look what he says. And one will arise at the sound of the bird. And all the daughters of song will sing softly. Now, wait a minute. The daughters of song are not singing softly. They're singing normally. You just can't hear it. But isn't it amazing? You go to bed and you're older and you can't hear what's going on outside but a little bitty bird. You wake up and you're awake all night. How can that be? I can't hear, but I can hear a faint noise. You've got to wait till you get old to appreciate that. So, Well, look what else he says. Furthermore, Men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. I think as men get older, uh, I heard one doctor or somebody read an article that a loss of testosterone, which happens over life, can tend to maybe bring things that a man fears when he's older that he didn't when he was younger. The almond tree blossoms, gray hair. The capperberry is ineffective. I think it's the ESV that says desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed and the pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. I think this is the figure of the dying process. And then the dust will return to earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Here we find the fact 
that Solomon is right, the prime of life is fleeting, and the glory of youth will end. And this is the picture that is given. It is amazing. You've got this litany of things that happens in old age. Your teeth go. Your ears go. Your eyes go. Sleep goes. Muscles are weak. Your joints ache. Uh, your hair goes. And it shows up in all the wrong places. It's amazing. And then your back hurts. Your mind. You can't remember anything anymore. And my dad used to say, old age ain't for sissies. And I know one now why he said that. But nothing works. And if anything does work, it squeaks. So it's just kind of like everything is just out the window. You know, I mean, this is the way it is. Young people, that's what you've got to look forward to. But now, wait a minute. Don't you hope you make it to old age? You don't want the alternative, right? <laughs> okay, so what you're looking at is what he is describing here. But I'm going to just do the conclusion of Solomon. He said in verse 13, the conclusion when all has been said, heard is fear God and keep his commandments. That's the conclusion. I believe Solomon is saying focus on your relationship to God. I believe he's also saying when you compare the whole book in really understanding it that we need to enjoy the blessings God has given us while we're on in this life. But no that our possessions, our pleasures, I guess you could say our trials and our sorrows as well, will be irrelevant when we face eternity and when we face God. Let's get back to, uh, we'll close out in uh, Psalm 40, 39, excuse me. All right. Um, Psalm 39, verse 7. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in Thee. You see, I think that he has, this is a turning point, and David understands his hope is in, is in God. And so I think he has come to this point. It's kind of like he's built up to that. Because as we have looked, all of these things, that, the frustrations he's gone through, and, and oh, and the other, I didn't read verse 6, did I? Surely a man walks about as a shadow. And by the way, that just means you have no impact. You think you do? But let me tell you something. Earlier, uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, you're not going to be remembered by anybody after a generation. Who are you kidding? I mean, the truth is, do you think you're going to have any impact? You don't have any impact. Man has no impact. Not really. The reality is that when we die, maybe in a hundred years, we'll, our picture will be in a little box somewhere. But folks, that's just the reality. That's where our hope is eternity. It's not what we leave on this earth, you see. That's what's exciting. But now he says... Okay, but what does man do? Man thinks he's really something, so he builds businesses. He builds the masses money. He says they make an uproar for nothing. That is, they busy themselves in vain. And then he says he amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. Who will gather them? What he means is who's going to get them when you're gone. Oh, you work all your life building this business and you're saving up for your IRAs and you do this. I knew a man many years ago at a former pastor. He and his wife take us out to eat once in a while. They didn't have any children. They worked at a famous place in this town, I won't tell you. Both worked very hard. Made, said, we have to have a million dollars to retire. And this was 35 years ago. And so a million dollars back then is a lot of money. I, he said, we want to live as we normally live. Then a few years later, they came back and they told us. They said, you know what? We're ready to retire. Well, great. I knew what that meant. It meant they got their million dollars. So they retired. And they lived happily ever for six months. And she died. And he was devastated. He was devastated. And he went into depression. He went into, it was just, they had worked so hard. They had sacrificed. They had sacrificed things maybe for normal living in life and enjoying life for out there, which never came. Anyway, the, I'll tell you how the story ended, how sad it is. After a few years, he was so depressed that he moved somewhere. And he, he met a lady and she took all his money and took off. And he ended up with nothing. Now, you can work all your life. You can say, kids, we can't have a vacation because we got to... When I'm 55, 60, whatever, we're going to retire and we're going to have fun. You may never get there. Don't you understand that? That all your hard work may go out the window and somebody else will be enjoying your money. That's the point. So David, see, with that, he goes on to say, my hope is in thee. That's the turning point. And when David says, my hope is in you, he's not saying, you're my last hope. No, he's saying, you are the one who gives meaning to life. Nothing else does. Nobody else does. You see, the truth is, God created us as, 
as believers, His elect, to be restless until we find our rest in Him for eternity. That's what we find Him saying. Now, I'll quickly close the rest of this out. Deliver me from my transgressions. Verse 8, make me not the reproach, make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become dumb. I do, that is mute. I do not open my mouth because thou, it is thou who hast done it. Notice that. What does he say? Wherever you're at in your life, God put you there. God is sovereign. He comes to the point, even in all of his frustration, because his turning point is, I'm going to hope in God. And he realizes, God, you did it. You put, now, you know what? If I'm really struggling and I know God put me here and I'm a Christian, that encourages me. That means God is in control of my life. I don't have to give up. You see? It's exciting to know that. God, you did it. Then he says, remove your plague from me because of the opposition of thy hand. I am perishing. Remember earlier the all the troubles and trials? He said, I'm perishing because of my sin. And he knows that, that God has touched him. But he's asking him, oh God, please take your hand off me because I am perishing. And look what he says. You know, he says, with reproofs, thou dost chasten a man for iniquity. He's saying now, God, I know from experience, he's just given testimony. I know, God, that when you want to chasten me or any man, when you want to chasten us for our sin, look what it says next. Thou dost consume as a moth what is precious to him. I like that better than the New King James. I think it's a little bit confusing. I think the ESV, which says, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. I think that and this New American Standard are the best. Listen, folks, what that is talking about is the moth destroys what's precious to you. What's an idol on your heart? What is it that you treasure more than God himself? Do you realize that it could be money? Yes. I mean, it could be a spouse. It could be children. Uh, it could be jewelry. It could be your body. You know, today we're just consumed with body beautiful. It's got to be just right. Right? We exercise, we exercise, we exercise. We've got to look great. Our body. We, you know what? Our, our self becomes the idol. Isn't that amazing? But that can happen, folks. But, of course, there's possessions, there's alcohol, there's food, there's all kinds of things. Anything precious to us that is in our way of God, God has to deal with us and He eats it away like a moth. Because you see, materialism, it exerts, exerts such a powerful influence on us. We get something and what do we want? Well, we want the next model better. Or we have to get insurance for that. And then we've got to buy something else to hide our boat. Or we've got to do this. Or we've got to buy that. Or it just goes on and on and we never stop, do we? Listen, hold lightly to the things we possess. They can be taken away from you in a moment. Hold lightly. And sometimes the Lord subjects us to trials just so that He can remove us from the grip of those things. You realize that? David sees that too. Surely every man is a mere breath. Selah. Stop and think about that. And that's what we've been doing. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with Thee. You know what he's saying? God, I'm estranged from You. See, that is a man saying he recognizes he's out of fellowship with God. But then he goes on and says, A sojourner, all like my fathers. He's not a citizen of this world. He's a citizen of heaven. And you look around at how crazy this world is. The other day I told Joyce, I couldn't hear, I heard this on TV or somewhere, I don't remember, some place, some state or some county made a law that when you get in your car, you have to seat belt your dog or your cat or you'll get a ticket. And I'm saying, I don't belong to this world. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, this world is insane. It is crazy. It really is. I've never seen anything like it. So David says, and so now, now what he says Turn thy gaze away from me that I may smile again before I depart. And we will all depart. He says, before I depart and am no more, please turn that gaze away that I might, might live as I need to live. Yes, friends? I'll close with these few thoughts. We need to think about the brevity of life. We don't like thinking about death, but we need to think about death. You know, I, I think over... It's 250 to 300,000 people a day die. And they either go to heaven or hell. 
Life is a breath. Just, that's it. Such brevity is here. And this is the way it's supposed to be. And God is good and that's the way that God made it. But the wise are going to consider it. And they're going to consider the other side of life that it ends so quickly. God uses suffering. He uses impending death to unfasten us from this earth. Set your minds on what lies ahead. As God wants to unfasten you from this earth and prepare you for death and eternity. My time is up, friends. I hope these things, contemplate on them, read it and meditate on it. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your word. Your word doesn't sugar, sugarcoat anything. You have spoken very boldly to us tonight through your word and King David. Thank you for that, Lord, because we realize that is truth. Though the world doesn't want it, nor do they want to think about it, we are not of the world. Our citizenship is in heaven. And sometimes, Lord, you put us in a place where you're, we're on our back and we have to look up. Lord, I pray that all of us here tonight will not be so stubborn that we have to make God put us on our back before we look up. Thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. Dismiss us now with thy blessing, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.